Okay, welcome. My name is Mike Tippett. I'm with Hughes. I'm joined today by Roger Billings from Cradle Point, and I'm going to have Roger introduce himself here in just a moment. But we're very grateful to have you joining us this morning for our discussion and fireside chat about 5G. Uh, many of us are uh, are seeing a lot, doing a lot, and involved in a lot of activity around connectivity, and it'll be fun to have uh, this conversation with Roger and uh, hear your comments and thoughts as we go through there. So with that, Roger, let me turn it over to you to introduce yourself and maybe just take a minute after that to talk to us a little bit about the current state of 5G in the U.S. and uh, where you think the operators are going at this time. No problem. Thanks, Mike. So I'm Roger Billings. I've uh, been with Cradle Point about uh, eight years now, a little over eight years. Uh, senior director here uh, working on advanced technologies and sort of a field CTO globally for operators around the world. And so I've got a unique visibility of what's actually happening around the globe. But uh, here in the US are our three major operators plus DISH, um, which is uh, our, our fourth up and coming one. They're starting to uh, get their, their feet under them now. So N77 or C-band was sort of released last year. And uh, by now, most of the operators have their spectrum allocated to them. So they're in the process of, of getting it up and running. So that means that uh, there's a lot of spectrum out there available for, for people. And you probably have noticed that if you're on um, one of the, the, the three major carriers. So starting with uh, T-Mobile, you know, they've got uh, their two and a half gigahertz spectrum. And that, that's cooking along rather nicely, but they're still in the process of expanding out. Uh, Verizon has re just received the last of their, their allocation, so they have about 200 megahertz of uh, N77 or C-band. And AT&T, they, they were fairly lucky in the, the last auction, and they got some, some spectrum to be able to compete with the other two. So they have uh, spectrum below CBRS, which is right in the middle of, of the N77 at uh, three and a half, and above, C above CBRS, so they're able to compete uh, uh, heartily there. And then DISH up and coming is uh, one of the first new carriers in the U.S. And uh, they're actually doing fairly well and, and we're doing some testing with them. What's unique about DISH, though, is that they didn't have a legacy of 4G to be able to contend with. So they're using something called standalone networking. And they have some very unique spectrum that they purchased over the uh, past few years, quite a bit of it. And so uh, they're, they're up and coming. But. Speaking of SA, SA, their standalone networks, is where the operators around the world are going because that is where um, you're only on a 5G network. You do not have a connection to 4G LTE. And so that's going to enable some interesting things as, as we go forward. You know, just, just for a moment, uh, you know, you touched on standalone or SA, and I believe the alternative to that or the, the opposite of that is non-standalone, uh, very technical. Uh, terminology, but could you just briefly give our audience uh, a quick picture of what uh, what that means with a, a bit more detail? Sure. So non-standalone is where we started out uh, when four, 5G was first announced back in 2019 uh, and, and the latter part of 2018. What it means is you actually have your cell phone, your cell phone connected to the 4G network, and then uh, the network queried the device and said, hey, it looks like you could do 5G. Let me add some 5G spectrum to your phone. And so that allowed you to have a connection to the core of the network using 4G, but added the added benefit of, of 5G to that. And every operator around the world, uh, except for DISH, who never had a 4G network, has started this way. And so what that means is that sometimes you see the 5G light, sometimes you don't, but you always have that LTE connection. The opposite of that, or where the world is going now, is that we're getting rid of the 4G core or, or phasing it out over the next five, six years. And so what that means is that when I connect to the network, I don't have to actually connect on LTE, I connect on 5G. And so that gives us some, some good benefits of much wider bandwidth because the, the bandwidth that's available in 5G can go up to 100 megahertz in terms of the amount of bandwidth per channel that you can actually get. Whereas 4G only went up to 20, but there's some downsides to that. And then the downsides were that with the SA networks, the chipsets when we first launched this weren't quite ready for 
for SA network. So they only allowed us to connect to one channel or maybe two channels. But that's slowly catching up. Our latest phones that we have out there, they're about a generation ahead of routers and other things. And so they're able to connect to two or three channels. So that's about 300 megahertz of, of possible bandwidth that they could actually uh, get a hold of. Our routers, on the other hand, are, are in the process of being upgraded. And so they allow us to connect up to two channels right now uh, in the upload. And um, right now we're waiting for uh, another upgrade from Qualcomm to be able to get some download, sorry, some, so two channels on the download and we're waiting for Qualcomm to give us some benefit with upload. And that's coming in the next generation chipsets, which the phones are just starting to, to participate in, but um, the, the routers are probably about another year behind on that. But we're still seeing some pretty good speeds. So on SA, uh, what I've seen in some areas was, um, you know, bandwidth up to a gigabit down and about 100 megs up, which is nothing wrong with that. But if we can get more channels in the upgrade, well, now we have the option to get a lot more bandwidth in the upload, which is where our enterprise is really wanting to, to go forth. And uh, talking a little bit there about enterprise, first of all, can you just give us a brief comparison or contrasting, you know, enterprise versus consumer 5G models, uh, you know, and things like that. And then let's talk a little bit more after that comparison about the enterprise specific or business use of 5G. Sure, thank, that's a good question, Mike. So when we look at uh, consumer, it's all about us, you know, our wives or, or partners being, you know, on TikTok and, and getting all that fun download with all those videos and, and, and so forth. And that's a lot of downwind, uh, bandwidth that's consumed in the download side of things. If we look at the enterprise, you know, where do the enterprise data centers sit? They no longer sit on site. They now sit in a data center somewhere or one of the AWS or Google or, or something like that. And so that's mostly an upload type experience. And so when we compare enterprise versus consumer, um, the applications are different. I need to get work done. I'm not looking at TikTok. I'm not looking at YouTube videos. I'm not looking at Netflix. I'm not doing all this bandwidth where some of the operators have been scared that they're saying, well, we're not sure we want to offer unlimited bandwidth to you know, an enterprise because they might blow our network up. Well, the, the usage and the applications running on that network are different than what the average phone would be. Yeah, if you put 50 phones on a single cell tower and they're all running YouTube and they're all running Netflix and all that, yeah, it's a lot of bandwidth that's, that's draining off the network. But you put 50 enterprises on there and we're probably seeing on average where we've seen in, in, the, in the world is 20 and 30 gigabits of download and upload per month, which is totally different than let's say a phone where you have a lot more than that if you're using a lot of video. So the applications that, that we're trying to deal with from an enterprise side are more of the, the, the cut the cord type things where the, the customer actually wants to replace their MPLS or their SD-WAN because they know they can get a lot better bandwidth for a much better price on a wireless connection. And so when we have that, that opportunity and we have operators giving good levels of, of pricing to be able to get that, then we know that the customers are going to say, why would I pay for an MPLS circuit, which you know is subject to fiber cuts and things like that, which is why I got the wireless to begin with, because fiber got cut, I need to keep my business running. And so a lot of customers started in the enterprise with failover, and now they're seeing it as an ability to say, I need to augment that bandwidth. I need to have more bandwidth. I can use SD-WAN in there, and then I can say, well, some of that can go over my fiber, and some of that can go over my wireless. And uh, so now they're looking at it and going, well, if I have two operators, and I'm dealing with two cellular connections, I've got a pretty good chance that I'm never going to go down. And so I also have a lot of bandwidth. And oh, by the way, it could be cheaper. Most of the times it is cheaper because the enterprise bandwidth, you know, is, is not that much more expensive or not that much more expensive on a cost per bit than any of the other services that you might have, for instance, plain old internet that you might get from a cable provider or something else, but a lot more reliable. Mm -hmm. So, so if, if, we take, if we take any type of connectivity, but in this case, 
5G connectivity and we start talking about it as a tool for business, uh, for mm -hmm. the enterprise. Um, it candidly, uh, to some degree for the home too, but for business, security obviously jumps to the forefront. Um, reliability is critical, bandwidth is critical, but I think security becomes something that you start to ask yourself, uh, you know, hey, this has to be this has to be secure because my business, my customer data and so forth are there. And I'm connecting to not my data center. I'm connecting to a cloud environment where the services that I need are being offered. Um, talk a little bit about how some of the security paradigms or frameworks, uh, you know, you mentioned SD-WAN, which is about moving the data to the right transport or to the right connectivity. But you know, we hear about um, zero trust, we hear about SASE, we hear about these different security frameworks. Um, is there anything different about them if we are in a wireless connectivity uh, or in a 5G specifically? Yeah, there is really. So SASE or uh, secure access, secure, um, I can't remember what the E stands for. Service Edge, sorry, Secure Edge, Service Edge, is something that we we are really starting to see a lot more of because the bandwidth is there. It used to be we had a whole pile of servers sitting at, uh, at a campus site or uh, an edge site, and they were performing a whole bunch of little things, making sure the firewall was done, looking at the content going through the network, making sure there was there was no loss. So data loss prevention was was happening there. So nothing went outside the environment. But that was an expensive enterprise to be able to put that together on every single site. Think of a, a, a big shop that has 3,000 or 5,000, like a, a big pharmacy. They have to have a pile of servers in each pharmacy to handle that. Now with the bandwidth that we get with 5G, we are now able to say, let's put that in the cloud. Let's actually make that, that all those servers that we had in the cloud, and oh, maybe I can add other things. So instead of protecting just a site, we're now able to protect the devices behind the site. And so we've invested heavily as Cradle Point in a SASE environment. We bought a company called Aircom about six months ago, and it's provided us the ability to not only protect the edge device or the edge site, but actually protect the end clients with things like uh, remote browser isolation. So you probably have all, what's the, what's the number one thing that people uh, get hacked about? You know, look at MGM and and uh, and some of the, the casinos in Vegas, you know, shut down because of a ransomware. Probably somebody, Johnny Clicks a lot, came in and clicked a link and now they're infected and they move sideways. And so that's where zero trust is really important because I don't trust anything. I can't move sideways. I can't go up and down. I only get access to the things I can get. Of. That way I control the amount of spread of, a, of an attack. But what if I were to stop that beforehand? What if I were to say, well, this is sort of a weird site. I'm not sure what it is, but let me open that for you, but not on your computer. Let me open that on the cloud. And so those are the sassy things that we can give with remote browser isolation, the ability to, to you know, cloud area um, service broker to be able to understand what the reputation is of that website and to be able to take from there. And so based on all that information now stored in the cloud, now being provided by 5G, I can actually get a lot better security because I have the bandwidth and I have the tools I need. Which brings us to sort of another point that, that I probably should have covered earlier is we are seeing the advancement of SA around the globe and it will happen here in the next sort of six to nine months here in the US, if not sooner in some operators. With SA or with standalone mode, we now get the full benefits of 5G and that's the ability, the first one that we're gonna have come in is something called slicing. If anybody's an old guy like me that, that dealt with MPLS and MPLS TE or traffic engineering, you realize that that wireline network was really cool, very expensive, but really cool. And that I could actually engineer a link between point A and point B for this type of tra one type of traffic. And I could have another link for other type of traffic. Let's say that's just plain old internet that goes out a different way. Now we take that example and we're not very smart here in the networking world. We just end up reusing the same things over and over again. So we take it and make it wireless. So slicing 
allows an operator to be able to put in specific sub interfaces on your wireless. I connect once to my wireless operator and I might have two interfaces that pop up or three, depending on what I need or more. And so in the consumer world, that's starting to, to come out on a couple of different operators where they're saying, those gamers out there on their cell phones, we want to give them the lowest uh, amount of latency because they want to pay more for that. And they're looking at monetizing their network in some of those ways. Now, I'm not sure any enterprises is a big gaming institute, but we still want that low latency. You know, before I joined this call, I was having some technical issues. And so I had to go to a different router to be able to get something. But what if I were to say, hmm, Verizon or AT&T or T-Mobile, I'd pay an extra 10 bucks a month so that my Zoom call or my Teams call always went through and I never had any, any problems because I know that traffic is going to go straight to where it needs to go. And so I have a guaranteed reliability or class of servants. And that's what slicing can provide. Or I can say, I really want low latency because I have this video application that I have cameras around a city and then they all need to be video processed. And I don't want to buy an expensive video processor on the camera. I want to put a $200 camera as opposed to a $3,000 camera on every light post. But I want to have that same amount of video analytics and the ability to have computer vision and AI looking at that. I'm going to centralize that in something called mobile edge computer, multi-access edge compute, or MEC, as it's called in the industry. And so now I have the ability with a specific slice to say that video traffic doesn't go to the Internet. It goes to a local pop that's in my city that allows me to process all that video and allows me to get a much better ability to understand what's happening in my city. Take that one step further, and then you start adding things like smart city and smart other, other things. And now I have the ability for a first responder to come in and say, oh, an accident just occurred. I want to look at that video. Well, let's give you a high speed link. Let's give you a slice for first responders that allows me to connect straight to that video server. So now I can look at it 15, 30 seconds after the accident occurred. And so these are the types of things that slicing can do from a, a government type entity, but we can also do the same thing from the enterprise. Enterprises has different ways of looking at things. And so they may have um, a hospital that wants to separate out some of their critical care, or they may wanna have a slice that goes into a hospital. It's just for plain old internet for the rooms totally separated out. So we take that concept of SD-WAN and now we have multiple interfaces on a single wireless interface, which allows me to then need SD-WAN and need all the security in the background to be able to choose this application goes over this slice, this other application goes over this slice. Have to have that intelligence. And, you know, CradlePoint being one of the first out there actually supporting this infrastructure uh, we're in a unique position in that we can actually look at that and actually steer the traffic appropriately. We've been doing this overseas in Australia for about six to nine months um, because their network is probably one of the more advanced networks in the world, and they've started rolling out slicing um, inside the, the, the Australian network. One of their prime use cases that they were looking at was the ability to have movie houses download their content when it's time for a new release, but they're only doing it between two and four in the morning. So they say, I'm gonna give you a slice between two and four in the morning that gives you the most bandwidth that we can offer you from that tower. And so you get that movie downloaded and you don't have it there way early. You don't have to spend and tie up all the resources while I'm downloading over regular internet. I'm doing a special internet for you. And, and so they're, they're allowing those movie houses to be able to get that content because it's a lot of bandwidth uh, when nobody else is using the network. But the that reverse slicing side. And, and, and differentiated services, if you will, uh, requires that the carrier, their network be on standalone, that they've got the more advanced That's correct. infrastructure, correct? That's correct. So, and so DISH, you know, DISH being uh, native standalone from the, the start uh, is good in that way. And the other carriers obviously are working very hard to catch up. Uh, and be yes, 
that's that's correct. And Dish is, is going to be sort of the uncarrier of, for our uncarriers. So they're really going to be going out there and being unique in the industry or in in the market in the U.S. in terms of what they're offering. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's going to be very interesting. They're going to give you the nerd knobs to be able to play with a pricing plan, um, the ability to play with the type of service you get, the ability to play with, well, I want this to this traffic to go this direction and this traffic to go to that direction. So they're really looking at it from a brand new, fresh aspect. And so it's rather interesting of, of where they're going. Well, when you introduce this concept of, you know, the slicing, um, it kind of uh, expands the, the whole idea that, you know, with 5G, whether it's, um, you know, uh, fixed to a, to a terminal or a, a low, you know, for a, for a business location or the handheld, it's no longer really feasible to say, oh, I'm going to backhaul all of my traffic back to a centralized location. It really does become point to point, point to cloud, point to data center and so forth. And with that, you really do need that enhanced security that we're becoming more familiar with as you talked about this, the, the SASE and the zero trust models so that I don't have to bring everybody back to my corporate headquarters or my corporate trunk and manage their access and control them and, and uh, protect them there. I can do it um, there. That to me starts to say, well, you need a you need a service, you know, you need a service provider or someone who can help you not only manage that security and manage those connections and you know understand which is where, uh, but you also need the technology like what Cradle Point's doing and things to say, hey, listen, we need to be aware of these, you know, different types, the differentiated service levels, the differentiated connectivity uh, and so forth. So um, have you seen, you mentioned Australia and the movie theaters, but have you seen any other good examples of uh, where people are taking advantage of these capabilities? Yeah, definitely. And so the other side of the coin is, is not on the download side of things, but it's on the upload. Now I have the ability to take video and make sure that video, uh, whether that's broadcast video. So the other option that we did is we actually had a roving camera and uh, something technically called radio resource partitioning, uh, which was an Ericsson invention to be able to say these five sims that are on video cameras can be in the pit at the F1 and they're going to have you know, better upload speeds because I'm going to dedicate a certain amount of bandwidth to each of those five cameras, which allows me to do that. Now, take that and take that same application and not for broadcasters, but for a city or for some other uh, entity that needs to have the ability to look at surveillance. Now I have the ability to say those are constant bit rate or there those are a certain amount of bit weight. I bit rate. I can actually guarantee that amount of bandwidth. And the same amount of maximum latency, minimum bandwidth that can be provided via the slice. And that's the first thing that Australia, they're going to be looking at is an SLA on a wireless link. That could be very shocking to a lot of people because how do you control the physics of the environment? Well, you can get down to the ability to say with resource part, radio resource partitioning or other tools like the slicing the ability to actually say, you have a minimum of 100 megs up, or 100 megs down, sorry, and 30 megs up, we're gonna guarantee that all the time because we know our infrastructure will support that, and a maximum latency of 20 milliseconds. Mm-hmm. Now, if I gave that to you as an SLA, I'm, and we're gonna charge you 80 bucks a month. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of companies would go, that's pretty damn good, mm-hmm. I like that. 80 bucks a month or whatever the price would be, and a guaranteed uh, bit rate, mm-hmm. a minimum and a maximum, that's pretty cool. I, I can handle that. And so that's where customers are starting to see if I can get an SLA on my wireless, they don't need to worry about that wired link anymore. I can yeah. go to a provider that can handle that. Agreed. And I have seen some articles recently where people are starting to predict you know, that a wireless first, a wireless only um, future is is certainly uh, on the horizon, if not approaching rapidly. Um, there's a couple of other areas that I wanted to touch on. Uh, the first the first one is um, I've heard a little bit about um, 5G and what is being termed as non-terrestrial networks or NTN. 
Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us just a little bit about what that is and what it entails? Yeah, so the non-terrestrial networks are the, the Hughes or the Starlink or other types of things that can be added uh, as an additional amount of bandwidth or a more uh, ubiquitous uh, ability. And these um, near Earth or what are NEO satellites that the, these providers are putting up gets away with some of the latency problems that we had when we had a geo which is, you know, it's a long way away. There's physics is it's going to take a while to go up and to come back down. And even LEO wasn't that good. It was okay, but it's still in there. But these near Earth satellites, you're basically, you're the base station and they're the moving client, if we look at it in that regard. But what's unique is they're starting to say, hey, maybe we could use 5G frequencies or 5G technology to be able to handle that. So, uh, things like uh, I think T-Mobile signed something with with Starlink where they can do SMS texting in the middle of nowhere mm -hmm. on Starlink for a small fee or whatever it is because they having that ability in the chipset to be able to do that. Now take that one step further and have the ability to have data no matter where you are. Mm -hmm. Now you you're really understanding how the network could be totally different no matter where I am. This is especially important when we start talking about first responders firefighters, ships, other things that go in areas where we don't have infrastructure. And being able to do that and have the level of service, I'm going on a cruise here in about three weeks, and I'm paying for the high-speed internet because I know it's got a, a high-speed Starlink internet on the boat. And so I'll, who knows what my experience will be, but we'll find out very quickly. So having that ability to have good speed and, and low latency. And the other thing that's unique about these is that these providers have more than one pop. So now if we think about taking the 5G technology with slicing and then saying, well, I want my traffic to exit here because that's closest to where I need my data center. Now I'm really taking that whole idea of my customized network for me not just a ubiquitous one where I get a SIM and I'm just like everybody else, but the network for me, because I have a slice mm -hmm. that says, I'm now going to go up in the up in the non-terrestrial network and come back down in this data center. And that way I now have the ability to have in that data center my, my security aspects, mm -hmm. my video processing, if I'm doing a video type application, or my local handoff to an Azure or AWS or something like that, where I can actually get my Office 365 much quicker. I now have the ability to put that enterprise traffic on it. Still early days. It's still not uh, not quite up there. I think Musk has still got quite a few more satellites to go, and I'm not sure where where Hughes and Echostar are at the moment with all of their le uh, okay. Neos. But um, I think that's okay. that's going to be where we go in the next five years. Awesome. And then the last thing I wanted to touch on was the, the concept of private 5G networking, uh, the concept where, you know, I'm going to use 5G spectrum or you, you, know, you may correct me on my terms there uh, in, in and around my warehouse or in and around my campus or in and around my large agricultural operation, these type of places. Mm -hmm. what, what can you tell me a little uh, about private 5G? That's a great question. It's a good segue because we've been talking about the public network so long. We now have the ability via either Ericsson or Credo Point to be able to offer you the same level of guarantee and service that you got on your public network on a private network. I'm not saying wireless, you know, uh, 802.11, you know, Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 5 is, is bad, but sometimes it just doesn't scale to the needs that we need, especially in large warehouses or large automobile manufacturing plants, you know, something like a, a, a Tesla manufacturing plant is huge. You can't cover it with wireless. So what covers huge areas? Well, we know how to do that in the cellular world. Let's do the same thing on the inside. The challenge we face is that um, we need to have spectrum. Luckily for us, we live in the U.S., and so we have uh, the Citizens Broadband Radio Spectrum, which is the 3.5 gigahertz uh, spectrum available to us and uh, dish bought one 
license of 10 megahertz in every single county in the U.S. So they're able to offer at least 10 megahertz of guaranteed bandwidth uh, through DISH in a private network. That means with 10 megahertz, I can get 150, 180 megs inside my network really easily. And if I think about an industrial network, I don't need a lot of traffic, but I need guaranteed traffic. I need low latency. I need the ability to make sure that that tool or that, that sensor or that robot has a co guaranteed connectivity. So when somebody crosses the line, the tool shuts down or the robot shuts down. And that needs to be happening really quickly. And I can centralize again that processing power. Instead of putting a bunch of processing power on each single robot, I can now put it in a centralized location and get much better scale. And so we're seeing application of that. Uh, our actual warehouse at Cradle Point in Boise, Idaho, is 100% private cellular. It's our private cellular. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's provided, it's a very huge warehouse. And we have three access points in there, I believe, mm -hmm. if, if maybe not two. And it covers the whole area. And that's with or without parts inside. And so that's the thing is that warehouses are rather tricky because one day you might have a full warehouse and the next day it might be empty. So how do you manage that? Well, cellular networking has been designed for these variable changes in the environment rather quickly in terms of turning itself up and down in terms of the amount of power and being able to steer that power a lot better than than the uh, the Wi-Fi networks in the past. And so that, that's where we're going. Then we look at things like Agriculture, that was a great point to bring up there, Mike. Um, we're starting to see farmers using this as the ability to have sensors in their fields, being able to do autonomous crop uh, picking or autonomous planting. And they can only do that if they have an infrastructure. And they're not gonna put a bunch of Wi-Fi access points out in the middle of a field. They're gonna use something that covers a two and a half mile radius and say, this is covered by one access point. And I don't have, need a lot of bandwidth, and if I can use CBRS to do that, that's great. If I'm outside the US or I'm partnered with a DISH or a Verizon or an AT&T or somebody else, a lot of times they offer their own spectrum internal to your building or in your site. So now you have the ability to use, let's say, millimeter wave in some cases to be able to handle some of these things. So we're seeing the, the really big emergence of private 4G and 5G, the, the technol technology doesn't really matter it's because at the end of the day, 4G is working just as well as the 5G. We just don't have as much bandwidth that we might be able to put together. Mm -hmm. So 5G gives us the millimeter wave spectrum if we need to have that. And 4G gives us the, the ability to support anything we want from a CBRS or in the case of over in Europe, or in other countries, they have that similar type of spectrum or N77 spectrum available for purchase by the government that you can use internally. So it's a really good point. Excellent. Well, that kind of covers the topics that I had hoped to, to discuss in our fireside chat. Um, I want to remind the audience that you have the option to submit a question in our Q&A window um, if you uh, have that question. But Roger, uh, I don't have any questions at the moment. So do you have any kind of final thoughts that you might share about 5G, the future of networking and so forth, um, either in summary or just kind of a final thought on this? Yeah, I think the final thought is we're seeing this convergence of SD-WAN, security, and 5G coming together. And so the ability to have a company that understands all of that is very critical. Obviously, Credit Point is one of the first that's been able to tackle all three of those at the single one time. But we need to say that if you're looking at 5G and you're looking at security and you're looking at SD-WAN or the ability to steer traffic to the right place at the right time at the right price, that's where you really need to think about using sort of a, a, a wireless first type infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're looking at a private cellular network, we can scale from anything from small to extremely large, underground, below ground, you know, above ground. It doesn't matter. We have the ability to support all of that with the technologies that are backed by you know, Ericsson, our company. I don't know. Sure. But, yeah. <laughs> um, but um, at, at the end of the day, uh, it's really important to understand what you want to use uh, 5G for and what the use case is and make sure that you have an operator that's able to take advantage of that. 
whether that's Dish or T-Mobile or, or Verizon or anybody else, you have to figure out what the location is and what the coverage is and how you can best use that network at the right price. Well, thank you. I appreciate that very much. And again, it's an exciting time. Uh, you know, we're looking very much at a wireless future, I think. Um, and, you know, continuing, this is not something that's going to turn off or turn on over the uh, over the coming, uh, you know, coming year or two. I think this is a, this is a long term play, but I think the ability to bring sites online quickly uh, without having to wait for build out uh, or the expense of a build out will be very, very important um, to to our audience. We're very, very thrilled to partner with Cradle Point on this webinar, this fireside chat. And going forward, we are very much excited about the opportunities that we have to work together um, as two companies that are in the wireless infrastructure, wireless operation um, space. And uh, the Hughes and Cradle Point partnership is going to continue to grow as we go forward. And I'm very, very excited about that. So again, Roger, thank you very much for your time. To all of you that took time to join us this afternoon, this morning, we appreciate your time and hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day and the rest of your week. Uh, take care and goodbye. Thank you, Mike.